And I'm going to be talking today about preclinical imaging of brain injury with ultrasound and photoacoustics. And I'm, I'm I got the subtitle here, new tools, new data. And really, you know, ultrasound and photoacoustics really is a, a relatively new tool when it comes to uh, imaging the brain in preclinical models, specifically uh, small animals like rodents. Um, <clears throat> It, it, there are a lot of different applications, primarily in something you may have heard of already, our cardiovascular applications, being able to do these um, uh, assessments of cardiovascular function, uh, strain blood velocity, and that kind of thing. There are also applications in the cancer imaging with uh, looking at volumes, uh, vascularity, perfusion, oxygen saturation there. Of course, neuro is what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, but there's other applications as well in developmental biology and, and many others as well. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of be zooming in on that brain imaging functionality today. And I'm going to be talking mainly about th three sort of different general areas, anatomical, functional, and molecular. Those are the kind of data that you're able to gather with, uh, with ultrasound and photoacoustics. Um, doing things in just being able to look at morphology, being able to do screening or early detection, looking at volumetrics, uh, onto functional, looking at uh, vascularity, perfusion, and then oxygen saturation, and then getting into some molecular imaging where we're actually using exogenous contrast agents to be able to see uh, different things. So what is photoacoustics and micro ultrasound? And I use the term micro ultrasound because we're using high frequency ultrasound. We send ultrasound waves into the tissue. Those waves are reflected back and we use that transducer to listen. Um, <clears throat> we're able to form this uh, really, really nice high resolution image. With photoacoustic imaging, it's really a hybrid imaging modality where we're using light to stimulate the tissue to generate an ultrasound signal. So we use pulsed laser light, shines into the tissue, it generates this, this thermoelastic uh, physical effect, which results in a pressure or ultrasound wave which comes out. And then we're able to uh, co-register that with a regular ultrasound signal. Now, what photoacoustics really allows you to do is uh, on top of that structural information, you're, you're actually now seeing optical information um, with, at high resolution and at depth. Of course, the advantages of both micro ultrasound and photoacoustics is that they're in vivo. Uh, it's non-invasive, non-ionizing, uh, a real-time modality. Um, and we also uh, allow the collection of things, other physiological parameters like ECG and respiration. We control the animal's temperature. Uh, we offer hands-free operation. And the key thing here really is uh, high resolution. Typical ultrasound is operating in the three to 15 megahertz uh, frequency range. Um, we are operating in the 30 to 80 megahertz frequency range. So the, the two images on the right that you see there, uh, one is a human fetus, the other is a mouse fetus. So we're going right down to about 30 micron resolution with our highest frequency transducers. This is what the system looks like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on you know, the, the exact mechanics of the system, but this is what it looks like. You see the ultrasound cart uh, on the right um, with a transducer hooked up to it. And then this is the laser cart that we use for photoacoustic imaging on the left. I've already pointed out the variety of data that we're able to collect with it. The workflow is quite easy as well, as opposed to something like an MRI, which requires really a specialized uh, technician to operate. This is um, easy for anyone to learn how to use. It's single operator. There's a lot of uh, automation involved there as well. And there's a, a whole bunch of different software and hardware tools for a, a number of different applications. But let's get to the let's get to what hopefully you're interested in, which is neurobiology. Um, this is a, a high resolution ultrasound image of a mouse brain. Now this brain has been excised. This is ex vivo. Um, but you know, the first time I saw an image like this, I sort of compared it to these histological images that you can get. Um, and it really stood out to me for, you know, being this, being able to really pick out these anatomical details. Um, we actually built a, a, a anatomical atlas into the system uh, so that you can uh, use this as a guide when you're doing your, your imaging. And we actually have hardware tools as well, something like a stereotactic frame, which attaches to our animal platform where the animal is anesthetized. We collect uh, ECG respiration, the animal's heated, and this holds the animal's head stable while you're doing the neuroimaging. <clears throat> So with 
just plain what we call B-mode ultrasound, uh, image-guided injections are a big thing. So being able to do injections, say, into mice embryos, and you're seeing here on the top right, uh, the uh, injection into the fourth ventricle of a brain of an animal, uh, an embryo. Um, and then there's uh, spinal canal injections. Uh, the bottom right image, you're actually seeing a pulled glass capillary needle going into the corpus callosum of a rat neonate. So there's all sorts of different image guided injections. Ultrasound is great for this because of the real time and uh, specifically with our system, the, the high resolution nature of it. Next, we'll move on to cerebral hemodynamics. You may have heard of ultrasound Doppler imaging. So this measures uh, the, the shift in frequency that occurs when something is moving. And when you're typically imaging uh, in the body of an animal, the blood is actually uh, the thing that's moving. So we're able to encode that frequency shift uh, in, into an image where you get red is basically blood flowing upwards, blue is blood flowing downwards, um, and you can collect these in 2D and 3D uh, and even do things like um, the pulsed wave do Doppler for velocity measurements in specific vessels as well. And I'm going to give a specific example of this right now where uh, we've got uh, a model where we do a reversible right common carotid artery occlusion model. This is to mimic a, a stroke. Um, so this is where we're actually in real time sort of tying off temporarily the right common carotid. And you actually see this is a real time image here of the on the right of a, a Doppler image of that occlusion. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to play that again, actually, just so you can appreciate um, the bottom uh, internal carotid here will actually reverse the flow of the direction because we're cutting off that right common carotid uh, flow. And you can see the reduction in flow in that right hemisphere there. We can, of course, do this in 3D and measure really the percent vascular uh, as measured by blood flow. Uh, so you can do uh, measure those changes as well. Now we can measure more than just the flow of the blood with photoacoustics. Um, the nice thing about uh, blood, in this case, deoxygenated and oxygenated hemoglobin, is that it absorbs differently, uh, op optically absorbs differently at different wavelengths. So at shorter wavelengths, deoxyhemoglobin absorbs a bit more light. At longer wavelengths, oxyhemoglobin absorbs a bit more light. And we can actually do a bit of a calculation here with multispectral imaging to generate a map of oxygen saturation, where the blue is less oxygen saturated blood, the red is more oxygen saturated blood. We can do this in tumors in the brain. This is just a mouse ear just to demonstrate. But I'll bring you back here also to our uh, common carotid stroke model here, where we're just, again, just cutting off the circulation temporarily in the right common carotid. Uh, and you'll see that oxygen saturation drops out uh, in the right hemisphere here, particularly in the cortex. Of course, then we can draw regions of interest using the software and uh, generate maps uh, over time of oxygen saturation. So you're looking at two ROIs here, the uh, I'll say non-ligated uh, hemisphere or cort cortical hemisphere and the ligated cortical hemisphere here. And you see that ligation when you do it on the right, um, you get a significant drop in the uh, oxygen saturation there. Again, we can do 3D um, scans as well, where you're now you're looking down top down view of the brain here. And you can see the difference between a normally perfused brain and this right common carotid artery occlusion model. Uh, another way to visualize uh, blood flow, in this case, uh, at least being sensitive right down to the capillary level is by using um, micro bubbles. So these are uh, small two to three micron size bubbles, which are injected intravenously into the animal. Um, and you can then see the perfusion in the brain uh, using these micro bubbles to really uh, highlight, um, uh, you know, individual vessels in this case, and and detect at least detect right down to the capillary level. Even if we can't resolve individually individual capillaries, we can detect down to that level. Um, and, and measure changes in perfusion. In this example here, we've got this hypoperfused area in the right hemisphere. Um, I don't think this was a common carotid occlusion. I think this is actually a, a, a tumor model where they had a glioblastoma growing in the right hemisphere. So you're able to now measure and quantify uh, things like um, relative blood volume and bl different blood flow parameters and identify different, uh, different areas through this, uh, this heat map here using the software. This is a way of enhancing contrast. 
Um, and this is this can be used in a variety of ways. Um, this is actually this image that you're seeing here, beautiful image, basically watching bubbles tracking through the circulatory system uh, in the brain of a rat, I believe in this case, uh, where there's been a craniotomy. So we're getting that really, really nice high resolution images um, because there's no skull to interfere with the ultrasound. Uh, and they, in, in this paper here, which was in neuroimage in, um, <clears throat> in 2011, they were able to do some basically functional imaging uh, using ultrasound uh, and, and looking at different somatosensory stimulation and how that influenced, um, you know, changes in, in vascular flow in the brain. So this is really a multimodal platform for looking at hemodynamics, combining blood flow, oxygen saturation, and total hemoglobin, by the way. This is two types of data that we can get with photoacoustic imaging, and then perfusion with the microbubbles. This is actually done in a study um, <clears throat> that was done in 2015 uh, by Dr. Kwan, uh, then at Emory University, where um, this was actually performed. Now, this stroke model, it involved um, hypoxia uh, or ischemia and then hypoxia. So initially, when the common carotid was ligated, you see this drop in the right hemisphere of uh, in oxygen saturation. Then the animal was put on hypoxic gas, so 7.5% O2. Um, and then you see a drop in both hemispheres where the, there's much, much less oxygen in the blood. Um, then the reperfusion occurs here. Um, after about half an hour, they reperfuse. So the ligation is released, the brain is perfused again, um, and even given hyperoxia in this case, where the animal was delivered 100% O2, and you see basically a full recovery in the non-ligated hemisphere and a stroke as a result of microthrombi occurring in the right hemisphere because of that ligation. The combination hypoxia ischemia uh, induces this, this model of stroke. Um, <clears throat> so this is a really neat uh, paper confirmed by some uh, histological uh, measurements as well. Uh, a little bit more recently, uh, last year, there was a, a study done with two different types of stroke, a photothrombotic stroke, which was much, much more uh, localized, and then a middle cerebral artery occlusion model stroke, where you had a, basically the whole hemisphere knocked out, similar to what we were doing with the common carotid artery ligation. Um, <clears throat> and here, photoacoustics was able to image, uh, you know, in the cortex here, and really identify that focal stroke with the photothrombosis or the, the more general, uh, less localized stroke with the middle cerebral artery occlusion. So that they could locate the, the foci of the infarct at a, a very early stage um, in this case. Uh, for traumatic brain injury, this is another uh, fairly recent paper that came out um, looking at, again, 3D oxygen saturation in the brain of mice. <clears throat> uh, and just looking at, you know, the, the effect of mild traumatic brain injury on, in this case, oxygen saturation. Uh, and they noticed that, indeed, in juvenile, mild TBI did provoke an early uh, transient cerebrovascular uh, hypooxygenation, so lower oxygen saturation in vivo. Um, and they're able to measure that. And the nice thing as well is because this is, uh, in this case especially, is a non-invasive technique. Uh, this can be repeated so you can follow the same animal over time, and do longitudinal studies of these kind, uh, especially in, in traumatic brain injury and specifically mild uh, traumatic brain injury models. Deviating a bit now, you know, I've been talking to this point mostly about mouse models. In this case, we've got a pig spinal cord model. So this is, there's been a laminectomy performed, the spinal cord is exposed, and the transducer is dropped down into the wound to be able to image. And the, you can just see here the unbelievable resolution. This scale is in millimeters, by the way. So two down to 19 millimeters. So, you know, we're looking at, oh, I don't know, eight millimeters across uh, diameter here. And you're able to really see these, uh, these small structures, the dura, the pia, the CSF in there. Um, this is a cross section of the spine, obviously. Here's a longitudinal section of the spine. 
So with the high resolution ultrasound imaging, really, really nice images of the pig's spinal cord. Uh, and this was an injury model as well, where they were doing, uh, I believe, a crush injury model um, and then seeing what happens, not just uh, with inflammation and other uh, reactions around the injury, just morphologically, but also doing these functional measurements of oxygen saturation and being able to measure, okay, how, how much, you know, what is the oxygen saturation of the blood in that area uh, after the injury as well. This is an earlier publication uh, looking at, again, spinal cord injury. In this case, uh, I believe this might have been a rat, but the laminectomy is performed, a model is induced, and they were able to do um, even just mor morphological measurements looking at volumes, uh, the, the volumes of the cavities that were created by the injury, and then looking at vascular effects using Doppler. So si observing what happens to the blood flow uh, as compared to the, uh, the anatomy in this case. So again, the combination of these uh, anatomical and functional measurements of us, uh, in this case, spinal cord injury. I want to talk a little bit just about sort of theory around photoacoustic imaging here. Now we're going to talk about multispectral photoacoustic imaging. Of course, to see oxygen saturation, that's also a multispectral imaging modality. Um, in this case, we can actually use, uh, we have a tunable laser source uh, from 680 to 970 nanometers. So we, we can tune that laser any, anywhere in that uh, <clears throat> a wavelength range or a color range. Um, and then you can use different contrast agents, specifically dyes, even things like um, some fluorescent dyes will work with photoacoustics as well. So here you see, this is a phantom that we use is just an acrylic block with some uh, tubes in it, fill it up with water, we image those uh, with our transducers. Um, and then we're able to generate these spectral curves. Uh, so we can see these spectral curves. Uh, and identify the component based on its specific spectral curve. Uh, and then we can uh, separate that or unmix it from the background. Background in vivo uh, that I'm talking about here is melanin uh, and oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So here's a, a this is just a tumor, for example, but here's a tumor. Uh, we can overlay the uh, oxygen saturated and deoxygen sat saturated blood. Um, and then there's these different nanoparticles that have been injected, IV in, in this case, in this animal, and we can overlay and unmix all of those different optical signals from each other. Whole a whole range of applications here from cell tracking, genetic reporter imaging uh, with the expression of, uh, say, melanin, um, looking at biodistribution of drugs, uh, and then some targeted molecular imaging. I'll give a really quick examples of some of these. Um, Specifically for uh, photoacoustic imaging, this is a, a combination of sort of image guided injection, but uh, injecting labeled stem cells. So looking at mesenchy mesenchymal stem cells, which have been labeled in this case with a, a Prussian blue in a nano nanoparticle. Uh, so they inject these particles into the brain and then they're able to visualize uh, the cells and visualize the migration of the cells uh, in the brain uh, completely non-invasively.